Good morning, and welcome to Medtronic's fiscal year 2021 third quarter earnings video webcast. I'm Ryan Weisfenning, Vice President and Head of Medtronic Investor Relations. Before we start the prepared remarks, I'm going to share with you a few details to keep in mind about today's webcast. Joining me today are Jeff Martha, Medtronic Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Karen Parkhill, Medtronic Chief Financial Officer. Jeff and Karen will provide comments on the results of our third quarter, which ended on January 29th, 2021. After our prepared remarks, we'll take questions from the sell side analysts that cover the company. And today's event should last about an hour. Earlier this morning, we issued a press release containing our financial statements and divisional and geographic revenue summary. We also posted an earnings presentation that provides additional details on our performance, as well as changes to our future revenue reporting structure, given our new operating model, which will go into effect next quarter. This presentation can be accessed from our earnings press release or on our website at investorrelations.medtronic.com. During today's webcast, many of the statements we make may be considered forward-looking statements, and actual results may differ materially from those projected in any forward-looking statement. Additional information concerning factors that could cause actual results to differ is contained in our periodic reports and other filings that we make with the SEC, and we do not undertake to update any forward-looking statement. Unless we say otherwise, all comparisons are on a year-over-year -year basis and are given on an organic basis, which adjusts for foreign currency. There were no acquisitions made in the last year that had a significant impact on total company or individual segment quarterly revenue growth. References to sequential improvement compared to the second quarter of fiscal 2021 and are made on an as-reported basis. All references to share gains or losses are on a revenue and calendar quarter basis, unless otherwise stated. Finally, reconciliations of all non-GAAP financial measures can be found on the attachment to our earnings press release or on our website at investorrelations.medtronic.com. With that, let's get started. And thank you for joining today. The Q3 results that we reported this morning reflect that our business is well on its way to returning to growth, with a sequential improvement in both revenue and earnings. This happened despite the impact of the COVID resurgence on procedure volumes in late December and January. We're also outperforming our markets, as our new products are driving share gains in an increasing number of our businesses. In fact, we outperform the market even if you exclude our strong ventilator sales. And when you consider that we're going up against a number of our competitors' year-end pushes, and our results include the month of January when COVID was having an uh, increased impact on procedure volumes, our performance is even more impressive. We're also seeing signs that our hospital customers are preparing for a robust recovery. For example, purchases of our capital equipment this past quarter have been notably strong. The use of our capital equipment, such as energy consoles, robotics, and navigation systems, is tied directly to procedures. So it's telling that hospitals are prioritizing spending on this type of equipment. Now, as we head into our fourth quarter, we're bullish on the recovery and our ability to return to growth and outpace our competitors. We feel that the momentum we have is going to build over the coming quarters driven not just by the COVID recovery, but by the strong new product flow that we expect to bring to the market. And we're supplementing this pipeline with an increasing cadence of tuck-in M&A. We've also implemented our new operating model, and we're enhancing our culture with a sharpened competitive focus. Through the actions we've taken over the past year, we're emerging from this pandemic as a stronger Medtronic, and I'm confident that we're well positioned for both the short and the long term. Now, as we've done on the past couple of earning calls, I'm going to lead off with the discussion of market share, which has become an important focus across the company. I acknowledge that the COVID impact on procedures, along with the timing of our quarter, does mask uh, some of the underlying market dynamics. 
but I hope that you're now seeing a strong trend of share gains for Medtronic. And there are multiple drivers for our improved market performance. Our prolific pipeline is key, but also the transformation of our operating model and culture is beginning to drive results. And the changes we've made during the pandemic, moving from simply serving as a supplier to our customers to becoming a true partner has driven stronger customer relationships and improved business performance. Our consistent and sustained flow of new products is our engine for growth. In the past quarter alone, we've received an additional 46 product approvals, bringing our total to over 220 regulatory approvals in the US, Europe, Japan, and China since January of 2020. Let's start with the businesses where we are gaining share in our cardiac and vascular group. We continue to outperform our competitors in cardiac rhythm. We gained another point of share this past quarter on the strength of our micro family of leadless pacemakers and our cobalt and chrome high power devices. Micra continues to perform extremely well with 64% uh, growth globally, including 76% growth in the U.S. In coronary, while we're dealing with the financial impact of the China drug looting stent national tender, we're still winning share globally. We estimate that our DES unit share is up three points year over year and two points sequentially, led by strong share gains in the U.S. on our one-month dual antiplatelet therapy labeling and expanded indication for high bleeding risk patients. And in China, we believe that being one of the winners of the DES uh, national tender strategically positions us to maintain our leadership in the China cardiovascular market. Not only do we expect to pull through uh, other products, but we expect to leverage our scale and reach to drive the successful future rollouts of our TAVR and Ardian products. In drug-coated balloons, we're growing well above the market despite increased competition. We gained a couple of points of share on the strength of our market-leading impact family. In fact, we're seeing continued strong adoption of our DCB for AV fistula maintenance for dialysis patients, driven by the publication of our data in the New England Journal of Medicine. Next, turning to our minimally invasive therapies group, our surgical innovations business had a good quarter against our primary competitor, J&J. We gained nearly a point of share year over year, driven by our energy and endostapling product lines. Our respiratory interventions business had a great quarter, growing over 75%. And this was driven by the importance of our airway and ventilator products in treated COVID patients. And as expected, our ventilator sales were down sequentially, but nearly tripled year over year. And our PB980 gained share in the high acuity ventilator market. We also gained share in airways, driven by our impressive growth of over 60% in video laryngoscopes. Looking ahead, our ventilator revenue should normalize as pandemic-related demand decreases, and we anticipate year-over-year -year headwinds starting next quarter. Our patient monitoring business also had a strong double-digit growth quarter. Our Nelcor pulse oximetry product lines grew double digits as we won share sequentially from Massimo. In gastrointestinal, we had some modest share gains, driven in part by our partnership with the NHS in England. The NHS is using our PillCam colon to help reduce large patient backlogs for colorectal screenings. And our renal care business grew in the high single digits with share gains in renal access. In our restorative therapies group, we're seeing share gains across several businesses. In cranial and spinal technologies, while share was stable year over year, we do believe we're up sequentially. We had a, we had a strong quarter in large capital equipment sales with a record number of Mazor robotic system unit sales and near records for our O-arm imaging and stealth station navigation systems. And with Mazor, we estimate that we continue to meaningfully outsell our nearest competitor, Globus, in the spine robotics uh, space. In neuromodulation, our recent product rollouts are leading to share gains in both brain modulation and pain stem. In brain modulation, our Percept PC launch has led to nearly a point of share gain year over year and several points of share gain sequentially from Boston Scientific and Abbott. Now, given our technology differentiation, we expect DBS share gains to be a multi-year trend. 
and Payne Stem, we're gaining strong momentum from our DTM launch, with nearly a point of share gain year over year, which is even more impressive when you consider that this business is facing a replacement headwind. Our DTM trials surged this quarter after the release of our 12-month data in late October. And overall, our trials are up 10% year over year, which is a really good leading indicator for the health of our paint stem business. In pelvic health, not only has the market growth accelerated over the past couple of quarters, but we continue to win share back from Axonics based on the differentiation of our interstim micro device. Since last quarter, we gained another point of share in Europe and three points of share in the U.S. We've now taken back nine points of share from Axonics over the past two quarters. And when you look specifically at the U.S. rechargeable market, we gained back 14 points of share sequentially this quarter. So there are a number of businesses where we are gaining or holding share, but there are still some businesses where we've got some work to do. In our cardiac ablation solutions business, we believe we lost about a point of share year over year and sequentially, primarily to J&J's broad EP product portfolio. Now, we expect this share performance to turn around in the quarters ahead, due in part to our Diamond Temp cardiac ablation system, which just received FDA approval. In cardiac diagnostics, customer response to our Link2 system has been outstanding. Given, uh, given our remote programming capabilities, enhanced feature set, and a four and a half year longevity. That said, we estimate we lost a few points of share sequentially to Boston Scientific as they enter this market. We continue now to ramp our unique wafer scale manufacturing for Link2, but expect to be supply constrained for the next few quarters. However, we are confident in the competitive differentiation of our Link2 device and we expect to maintain our strong leadership position in this market that we created and have innovated for the last 20 years. In neurovascular, while we held share year over year with strong growth and aspirations and, and coils, we lost a bit of share sequentially. And this was primarily in flow diverters as new entrants, specifically Terumo and Stryker, pick up some share. We have a series of new product launches coming in Neuro the, later this calendar year, so I'm confident that after the initial impact of competition and flow diverters, that we'll get back to taking share. In diabetes, we're making considerable progress in our turnaround efforts, and we actually returned to growth this quarter. While we're still not growing with the market, we're gaining momentum with the successful launches of our 770G system in the U.S. and the 780G which is now available in 26 countries across four continents. Now, as a result of all this, we estimate we picked up several points of durable insulin pump share sequentially. Next, let's turn to our product pipeline. We're at the front end of a number of large opportunities to win share and create and disrupt big markets, all aimed squarely at accelerating our growth. A number of these catalysts are on deck this calendar year, and the long-term pipeline also remains full. Starting with CVG, we're expecting to present our on-men renal denervation pivotal trial results later this calendar year, likely uh, at the TCT conference in October. This could be one of the most important events in medtech this year, given the multi-billion dollar addressable market in hypertension. Now, depending on the results of our on-med trial, we're planning to submit for FDA approval later this calendar year, and we've already been granted breakthrough device designation. In our cardiac ablation solutions business, we are expecting a first-line therapy indication for our Arctic Front cryo balloon in the first half of this calendar year. We also continue to uh, make good progress on bringing our disruptive pulse field ablation system to market. In structural heart, we expect to roll out our next generation Evolute FX Taver valve later this calendar year with its enhanced deliverability and ease of use. We continue to enroll the pivotal trial for our intrepid transcatheter mitral valve as well. And we're pleased to see that Half Moon Medical, which is our partnership with the Foundry, completed the first in human procedure of its differentiated transcatheter mitral repair technology. This unique device has the potential to be very disruptive to current mitral clip technology. In MITG, we're really excited as we're nearing some very important milestones for our Hugo soft tissue robot system. 
We remain on track to submit for CE mark and to file for US IDE approval next month. In RTG, we're investing heavily in growth opportunities. In neurosurgery, we're expanding the capabilities of our Mazur spine robotic system. In pain stem, we're expecting to launch our recharge free device later this calendar year. This is a big opportunity for Medtronic to dramatically increase our share in the recharge free category of pain stem. We also expect to submit our ECAPS device to the FDA later this calendar year. ECAPS could be a very disruptive technology in pain stem, and we intend to bring it to market combined with all the advantages of our DTM therapy and our Intellis device platform. In brain modulation, we expect to launch our Sensite directional lead later this calendar year, which will close a key uh, competitive gap. In fact, when you combine Sensite with our Percept PC device, our deep brain stimulation system will be far ahead of the competition. And we're not stopping there. We're now enrolling our ADAPT PD pivotal trial, which is studying our closed loop adaptive technology that will further extend our leadership position in DBS. In neurovascular, in addition to the flow diverter launches I mentioned earlier, we have five additional products that we plan to launch this calendar year. Now we haven't disclosed the details of these launches for competitive reasons, but we're excited about the innovation that we're bringing to the stroke market. In diabetes, we have now submitted the adult and the pediatric 780G insulin pump and Zeus sensor to the FDA to provide them with an efficient means to simultaneously review uh, our multiple submissions. Approval timing, well, that's going to be dependent on the FDA's bandwidth. As the uh, branch of the FDA responsible for diabetes product reviews has focused their resources on COVID diagnostic submissions. Regarding our synergy sensor, which is disposable, easier to apply, and half the size of our current sensor, we've completed our pivotal trial and intend to submit it to the FDA once we complete our manufacturing module this summer. I'll now have Karen take you through a discussion of our third quarter financials and our outlook. And then I'm going to come back with some concluding remarks before we go to Q&A. Karen, over to you. Thank you. Our third quarter revenue declined 1% organic and adjusted EPS declined 10%. As Jeff mentioned, we're well on our way to returning to growth. As sequentially, our revenue increased 2% and adjusted EPS grew by 26% on the strength of our new products and execution. While the resurgence of COVID did impact our performance across several businesses, we continue to view this impact as temporary. It's worth noting that our average daily sales in the third quarter were tracking higher than the second quarter through the latter part of December. However, we saw a step down driven by the COVID resurgence starting in the holiday period and continuing through the end of the quarter. Procedure volumes were light in many geographies and specifically impacted our surgical innovations, spine, and many of our cardiac and vascular businesses. As Jeff mentioned, despite the slowdown in procedures, sales of our capital equipment were strong and point to a turn soon. While our third quarter revenue was in line with street expectations, we came in 14 cents ahead of consensus on EPS, with an 11 cent beat on better operating margins and three cents on tax. FX, which was a greater than expected tailwind to revenues, was a headwind to EPS, two cents more than our November expectations. We continue to see strong sequential improvement in our adjusted margins, 180 basis points on our gross margin and 430 basis points on our operating margin. Our operating margin improvement was faster than expected, driven in part by expense controls in SG&A. Down the P&L, our tax rate came in lower than we expected, as we finalized taxes owed on certain prior year's returns during the quarter. Turning to our balance sheet, our cash position is strong, and we remain focused on investing, both organically and inorganically, through tuck-in acquisitions and minority investments to drive our long-term growth. We recently announced another acquisition, of the radial artery access portfolio 
from privately held wrist neurovascular and now have eight tuck-ins since the beginning of last calendar year with a combined total consideration of approximately $1.7 billion. We expect these investments to fuel revenue growth acceleration and create strong returns for our shareholders. And we continue to supplement these returns with a strong and growing dividend. We are an S&P dividend aristocrat, having increased our dividend for 43 years, and our yield of 2% places us in the top quintile of all S&P 500 healthcare companies. Now turning to our outlook. While we expect the impact from the COVID resurgence to diminish, the effect from the ongoing pandemic to our business remains challenging to predict. So we will continue to not provide our typical guidance. That said, I do want to give you our sense of the trends ahead. We continue to see a lag in our average daily sales in the first couple of weeks of February, but we expect that to steadily improve, not only as we exit the month, but throughout the quarter, as COVID hospitalizations decrease, ICU capacity increases, and hospitals return to more normal procedure volumes. Said a different way, we expect March to be stronger than February and April to be stronger than March. As we look at fourth quarter street expectations and from where we sit today, we are comfortable with street consensus on revenues and EPS. Within this, it's reasonable to think about organic revenue growth in a range between 30 and 34% if the recovery trends follow our expectations. In that case, by group, RTG organic growth would be around 50%, CVG around 40%, and MITG around 15%, reflecting the continued ramp down in ventilator revenues and a tough year-over-year -year comparison. And diabetes organic growth would be in the high single digits. On the P&L, while we continue to invest in our product pipeline and launches, we do expect sequential operating leverage as our revenue improves. Therefore, we would expect around a point to a point and a half improvement on gross margin and a point and a half to two points improvement on operating margin, both on a sequential basis. Regarding currency, assuming recent rates hold constant, the tailwind to revenue would be roughly $250 million. On the bottom line, we expect an approximate four cent headwind. I'd like to end by reminding you that our new operating model became effective earlier this month, and I'm excited by the impact it will have on our culture and our ability to drive growth acceleration. It will have minimal impact, however, on our external reporting, and you can refer to the slides in our earnings presentation for details on the minor changes going forward. Back to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Karen. Now to wrap up. We're continuing to put points on the board with strong execution across the organization. We're winning share in an increasing number of our businesses. We're executing on a record number of product launches. We're accelerating our growth. Our end markets are coming back. And we have exciting opportunities ahead of us. And importantly, we're positioning the company for long-term success as we continue to invest in our pipeline, enhance our culture, and execute our new operating model. We're empowering our 20 operating units. We've delayered and decentralized the organization, giving us greater visibility into our end markets and increasing our speed, decisiveness, and competitiveness, while at the same time leveraging the strengths of our enterprise in areas like manufacturing and core technology development. And we're able to accomplish all of this because of our talented organization. I want to thank all of our employees for another great quarter and their continued hard work and commitment to the Medtronic mission. So with that, let's now move to Q&A. We'll now turn to the Q&A session with the Medtronic executives answering live questions from the sell side analysts that cover the company. I'm Francesca DiMartino from the Medtronic IR team. For the sell side analyst that would like to ask a question, please select the participants button and click raise hand. If you're using the mobile app, 
press the more button and select raise hand. Your lines are currently on mute. When called upon, you'll receive a request to unmute your line, which you must respond to before asking your question. Lastly, please be advised that this Q&A session is being recorded. For today's session, Jeff, Karen, and Ryan are joined by Sean Salmon, EVP and President of the Cardiovascular Portfolio and the Diabetes Operating Unit, Bob White, EVP and President of the Medical Surgical Portfolio, and Brett Wall, EVP and President of the Neuroscience Portfolio. We will pause for a minute to assemble the queue. We'll take the first question from David Lewis from Morgan Stanley. David, please go ahead. Great, good morning, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine, David. Great, thank you for taking the question. Just two for me, I'll start with financial. So Karen, I appreciate all the detail you gave us. Just want a, a couple of clarifications here. One, um, you talked about March better than February. You know, some of your peers have talked about February beginning to bounce a bit or improve relative to January. Have you seen February begin to turn and is there anything about fiscal 22? I know we're not going to get uh, full guidance for the full year, but anything about street models in the forward year that you call out at this time that we should be focused on? And then I had a quick follow-up for Sean. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the two questions, David. Um, in February so far, if we look at our average daily sales rate by week, um, we have not yet seen a turnaround, but we really do believe that it's it's due to the tough weather in the United States. Um, and so we, we, we do believe that we will see that turnaround very soon. We think we're already seeing it in terms of procedures in hospitals. And again, we're focused on March being much better than February and April much better than March. Um, if, we, if we think about FY22, you know, it's still early. We are still in our planning period. And, and while I'd love to give, you know, some guidance on FY22, it's premature given you know, the fact that the COVID is still uncertain and we're, and we're still in our planning period. Okay, and then just to my follow-up here, just quickly for Sean. I mean, Sean, the diabetes business obviously was the standout versus most street models here this quarter. I just wonder if you could talk about you know, what you're seeing in 780G relative to what we had seen historically with 670G. Um, you know, the guidance for next quarter probably doesn't seem as strong as I would expect given the momentum in diabetes this quarter. So is there anything to think about there? And then um, just uh, any sense of kind of Zeus versus Synergy in terms of relative timeline, does it make sense to launch those products independently if they're going to be sort of right on top of each other from a following strategy? So just a, a general diabetes update would be very helpful. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, David. So I'd say with 780G, you know, what people are really enjoying about that is getting to stay in auto mode a lot longer. So that leads to better glycemic control. In the early reports, people are in the kind of the 90s in the post-market uh, realm for, for glycemic control. But more importantly, they're not getting interrupted to take blood sugars. That's cut down in half. They're, they're able to sleep through the night with really good blood sugar control. And we measure things like net promoter score on, um, on a product level as well. And it's up about tenfold from what we saw for the experience of the 670G. So, you know, a very, very big improvement. And we're also seeing on the 670G, I think the transmitter, which connects the CGM to the pump, uh, seems to function better than the way we used to connect that on 670G. So it's more reliable. And that, that coupled with being able to see your numbers on the phone has led to a better experience as well. And of course, that pipeline is upgradable to um, not just the 780G, but also the new sensor pipeline you asked about and, and the extended wear infusion set. Uh, with regard to the Synergy, you know, we've already filed Zeus. That was filed in November. Synergy will be filed upon the completion of the manufacturing validation in the summertime. So they, they will be separated um, by probably enough to make a, a difference where we're going to want to have both products in the market. But we'll sort that out. We don't need to launch it if we don't need to launch it. But I think we're going to have a period of time where Zeus will precede Synergy for both pump integration as well as standalone use. Great. Thanks, David. Let's uh, go to the next question, please, Francesca. The next question comes from Bob Hopkins at B of A Securities. Bob, please go ahead. Oh, great. And uh, good morning. Um, so uh, two quick things, and thanks for taking the questions. First one, just to follow up on David's question on, on 2022, um, if you assume, you know, no third or fourth wave of COVID, and I, and I realize that's an uncertainty, but if you just assume that doesn't happen, 
Um, Karen, is there anything about the, the street consensus that, that sticks out to you in, in that scenario? Yeah, I, I would say, um, uh, Bob, it is, you know, it, it is early to tell from our planning process, but, um, you know, you can expect very strong uh, growth off of a depressed base next year. And, you know, the street is expecting that. So, um, you know, hard, harder for me to give guidance beyond that when we're still in our planning process. Okay. Um, and then for, for Sean um, or, for, or for Jack on CVG, that was the, the one um, division in the quarter that was a little bit weaker than you originally thought. Um, and I was wondering if you could just comment on that broadly, you know, how much of that was simply um, worse than expected on the COVID side, uh, you know, versus, uh, you know, other things that surprised you during the quarter. And, you know, and, and I asked the question, you know, because I want to understand what sort of turns around momentum in that division relative to your expectations. Thank you. I'll, I'll let Sean, uh, Sean, you want to go ahead and take that one? Yeah, sure. Well, so first of all, I'd say that, you know, we got affected by a few things in the quarter, mostly coming out of the holidays and into January. We saw the more elective parts of CVG um, slow down uh, due to COVID and also where we had more concentrated kind of hospital clusters where, say, you're in a tertiary care setting for like TAVRO or cardiac surgery procedures. When you had cities shutting down because of COVID, we just had more of an impact on volume. And it's it's come back a little bit. Uh, but for some weather here in the February time frame, as Karen described. But I'd say generally, you know, the things that were moving the quarter were, were Micra, also Tyrex. They were both really good. DCB is coming back. And the CRM portfolio, with the exception of Tacky, which still has its replacement headwinds, was moving in the right direction. Um, as I said, Tappy was a little slower than we had hoped quarter on quarter, but we think it's going to pick up momentum as we go forward into the next quarter. And of course, in core coronary, while we gained share, we did have a $45 million headwind due to the China DES tender, which is uh, you know, going to recur every quarter until it, it annualizes. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Let's uh, take the next question, please, Francesca. The next question comes from Robbie Marcus at JP Morgan. Robbie, please go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Congrats on a good quarter. Um, maybe two questions. I'll just ask them up front, uh, probably both for Karen. One on um, margins. You, you did great OPEX control in the quarter. SGNA was down sequentially, which we typically don't see. Um, you know, how are you thinking about coming out of COVID, going into fiscal 22? How much leverage can we see? How much is spending that's been held back versus needs to be uh, put into place once? Uh, procedures come back. And then second, if you could touch on free cash flow, trends continue to, to look pretty encouraging. How should we think about free cash flow conversion going forward? Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Robbie, for both questions. Um, we did see good uh, continued expense control this quarter, um, particularly in SGNA, and we would expect that to continue. You know, that has helped drive our sequential margin improvement. It's not the only thing. Obviously, revenue growth helped drive it too. And we talk about the fact that we expect sequential uh, margin improvement, both in gross and operating margins for Q4. You know, as we think ahead, I would just um, uh, keep in mind that our fourth quarter uh, operating margins tend to be our highest margins. So I wouldn't necessarily extrapolate those um, onto the full year for next year. Uh, but we do, again, expect to have continued uh, good expense control. And in terms of, of free cash flow, yes, um, we have seen very encouraging uh, things with free cash flow, both on, you know, better than it's expected uh, profit uh, from the beginning of the year, um, along with, you know, better than expected uh, collections on accounts receivable, uh, despite the pandemic. Um, so we've got, we've got good momentum, particularly in both places. Um, and you've seen our free cash flow uh, at least year to date be above that 80% conversion. I would say that you know free cash flow is more of an annual metric because cash flows can be lumpy. Um, and while we may be under that 80% conversion uh, rate for the full year, um, just because of of COVID and the pandemic, you know we are clearly committed to that conversion rate um, being above the 80% going forward. Great, thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, next question, please, Francesca. 
The next question comes from Larry Beagleson at Wells Fargo. Larry, please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, one, one for Bob, uh, one for Karen. Can you hear me okay, Ryan? We can. Yes, thanks, Great. Larry. Great. Just so, so Bob, on the surgical robot, uh, the filing seems like it's on track. Um, can you talk about uh, how you're feeling about the 100 uh, to 150 basis points of contribution to growth in fiscal 22? Um, you know, it, it seems seems like a lot at this point. And any any reaction to the J and J system? And, and I'll ask uh, my question for Karen. Karen, I apologize on, on fiscal 2022. I know we're going to get a lot of questions on it. Um, so by my math, your guidance implies about three to four percent underlying growth in Q4. You know, should we be thinking about? Is there any reason why we shouldn't be thinking about fiscal 22 underlying growth of about five percent? Or you know, there's ventilator. You have headwinds like ventilator sales, about uh, the valiant you know recall and the extra week in 21. So does that make you know five percent underlying challenging? And, and is there any reason why the margins in 22? You know, won't be in line with 2019. You're exiting uh, this year at about 29%. Uh, thanks for taking the questions, guys. Uh, great. So uh, I'll go first, Larry. Uh, thanks for the question. We continue to expect uh, to hit those same revenue contributions, Larry, I gave you in Hartford, right, which was less than 50 bips in 21, 100 to 150 in 22, and then in FY23, 200 to 250. And look, the feedback on our system and our approach to building out the digital ecosystem, which you and I have talked about around touch surgery enterprise has been really positive. We, we feel confident our portfolio is competitive and, and we'll really expand the marketplace that I've talked about a lot going forward. So I think we're on track, uh, uh, Larry, with what I told you. And of course, as Jeff mentioned in his, uh, in his comments a few minutes ago, we've got some really important milestones coming up, but uh, we're really excited about uh, where we're at. And um, as you'd anticipate, I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to comment on the, the J&J system, Larry, uh, other than to just say we feel really great about our platform, the feedback we've got, the open counsel, the modularity, the upgradability, the leverage of our surgical instrumentation. So we feel great about the competitiveness of our system, and we're excited to hit those milestones we talked about uh, here in March. So uh, with that, I'll, um, I'll hand it back to Karen, I think. Yeah, and Larry, I appreciate the questions on FY22 and recognize that you guys are getting those questions. Um, and so I would love to be able to give you a lot more color, but I really, you know, we're, we're really in this planning phase. And so it's very difficult for me to give you, you know, more color than I've given. Um, you know, expect a strong growth off of a depressed base. Um, you know, we're very excited about our pipeline and our launches ahead. And we've talked about you know, revenue growth um, being strong and accelerating into the future. So, you know, just uh, we'll give you color when we can or official guidance if, if the pandemic clears on FY22. But in the meantime, you know, we're just going to have to wait until until our fourth quarter call. Yeah, no, I look, I, just to emphasize, we are bullish about, you know, FY22, but it is, we're just, it's too early for us to give uh, any specific guidance. Understood. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Larry. Next question, please, Francesca. The next question comes from Vijay Kumar at Evercore ISI. Vijay, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, guys. Congrats on uh, solid print here for TQ. Uh, I have two uh, product questions. Maybe uh, the first one on diabetes. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, you look at the, the timelines here uh, on 780 plus service, um, you know, that's subject to the FDA. But based on, I guess, uh, how the 780 launch has gone in, in Europe, uh, do you now feel more confident about getting back to market growth just with 780 plus service? Uh, and I'm curious on Synergy, you said the trial is complete. Have you seen the data? Uh, do you think you, you, you know, the product can get an ICEM label? Yeah, hi, BJ. So. 780, yes, the, the device is very competitive, and I think we'll do well with it when we get into the marketplace. You know, the sensor experience has continued to be what we need to improve, and you know, of course, we have the pipeline work for that. Uh, with regard to the Synergy data, we'll, we will be filing an abstract with that, as well as the Zeus data, hopefully for, the, uh, for an ADA presentation. So you'll see the data when it becomes available if that abstract gets accepted. Gotcha. And then one, um, I guess, on uh, RDN, uh, I, I'm curious, uh, the, the, uh, 
the device has a breakthrough destination, the new MCIT ruling. How, how does that aid adoption here? Uh, I'm, I'm curious on uh, how we should be thinking about the revenue ramp now that you have a pathway for reimbursement. Yes, yeah, so PJ, that, that would give us four years of reimbursement if it uh, survives the administration change, of course, within the Medicare population. And that's a about, if I look at the trial population that we studied so far, that's about a third of the population that was in the study. So that means that the rest of the work needs to be done for, um, for commercial payers. And that's going to be a street fight, you know, state by state, payer by payer. We're already beginning that work. But that, uh, that would be the bigger work to do within reimbursement. And of course, that has to be repeated at the country level all around the world where we have regulatory approvals. So the, uh, you know, the availability of reimbursement is a critical part of that adoption curve. And just to remind you, we think that we can get that to a $3 billion market with just a 1% penetration. So it's a huge opportunity for us and reimbursement will be important for that, the speed of that ramp. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Vijay. Next question, please. The next question is from Peter Tickering at Deutsche Bank. Peter, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, Karen, a follow-up question for you on Robbie's question on operating margins. Uh, you talked about a very strong SGNA. Okay, give us color on how gross margins were able to grow sequentially by 180 basis points despite negative organic revenue growth. And as revenues begin to normalize, why they couldn't be more tailwinds uh, in the fourth quarter versus, you know, uh, with the guidance he gave us. Yeah, so on, on gross margins, um, you know, those are clearly impacted by price and mix and, you know, other things like tariffs um, that, that can come into play. So, um, you know, we do expect, we've had sequential improvement. Um, we expect continued sequential improvement as we talked about. And where you see it mostly showing up so far is in the operating margin. And, you know, because we are driving uh, greater expense efficiencies on the SG&A line in particular, and you can expect that uh, to continue. Okay. Uh, then in the script, uh, I think you did a talk about the strength of capital markets. And in your press release, you highlighted uh, Missouri and the OARM. Uh, many hospitals will spend whatever they capitally have at the budgeted by the end of the year. Otherwise, they lose it. Uh, can you sort of talk, walk us through what you're seeing in the capital market sort of in January and through February and what you're seeing or hearing from the field for calendar 2021? Thanks so much. Well, well Peter, well, yeah. you know, we're just seeing, you know, we're, look, this, there's the, the capital equipment that, that, that obviously that we sell is directly tied to procedures, right? Um, um, elective procedures that are, tend to be uh, in, in the United States in particular, high profit margin for, for the hospitals. And uh, we're 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 tying this to um, one the value proposition in, the, in this equipment, right? Which we've invested in over the years, and, and how it enhances the procedure and uh, and the outpatient outcomes. But it is, a, I think, in our mind, a signal to a, a, a snapback in in, in in patient volumes um, coming, you know, that we expect over the coming over the coming months. And and that's consistent with the conversations we've had with hospital CEOs over the last two weeks. I don't know, Brett, if you want to add to that. Yeah, really the same, Jeff. We're seeing uh, it. it uh, we haven't seen the turn yet in procedures after the January resurgence, but the capital markets uh, remain uh, strong, and uh, the uh, you know hospital CEOs and others uh, are uh, really preparing for that, and then upgrading their existing fleets of uh, of, um, of navigation and imaging, uh, and, and then we we've seen the uh, the strong robotics quarter. So we think that portends well for the future here as we get through this time period and uh, resurgence of cases commences. Great, thanks. Thank you, Peter. Next question, please, Francesca. Okay, the next question is from Matt O'Brien at Piper Jaffrey. Matt, please go ahead. No, oh, thanks for taking the questions. Um, I guess, Sean, just for starters, again, on the product side of things, you know, Micra had another great quarter, getting tougher on the comp side of things. I'm just curious between VR and AV, where you're at in terms of penetrating those two indications, and especially on the AV side, what are you seeing in terms of adoption um, in that indication, and, and how much room do we have to go there? Yeah, I'll have to get back to you with the specifics, but just in general, the the VR 
is uh, penetrating within that single chamber market a little bit more. And that's a phenomenon we see deeper in the U.S. We see outside the U.S. And the AV is driving growth for the most part, except for China, where we've been introduced the VR. And that's starting to take off. It's only there, as well as um, you know, in Japan, we only have the VR version. So we have the AV coming in the third quarter of next year for, for uh, Japan. So we think that that's going to be a big growth driver for us uh, to continue the micro penetration. But there's there's headroom to grow. And of course, we haven't uh, we haven't t- touched the other market, which is the uh, AV block market. And we have a future product for that with Matril version of Mitra yet to go. Got it. Sorry to put you on the spot there, just given how short you've been in that seat. Um, I guess, Jeff, question for you, just on the new product side, there's just been, you know, just a there's a, a long uh, list of new products that you're introducing, which is great to see. I'm just curious how potentially you could be impacted negatively because of COVID, because of hospitals' inability to adopt new technology in this environment and, and how you kind of, um, how that could potentially slow down you know, some of these new products uh, as we get into fiscal 22 and how you kind of guard against that? Actually, um, actually, what we've seen uh, is despite, obviously, the COVID overhang has impacted all elective procedures and has been a, a headwind for us in total. But where we're launching new products, even in, you know, this, uh, the backdrop of this, these market conditions, we're seeing adoption. Would it be better Without uh, COVID, absolutely, but we are still seeing adoption. I mean, uh, you know, Sean was just talking about, uh, you know, Micra. I mean, it's it, it grew again another great quarter at seventy-five uh, percent in the U.S. and sixty-four you know, percent or something like that globally. Um, you know, uh, in 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 um, in in our neuroscience or in, in in RTG, you know, in the neuromodulation space, whether it be our our new technology in pelvic health or uh, our deep brain stimulation, our Percept PC deep uh, neurostimulator, um, or in you know in pain, uh, our new pain products, uh, you know, the DTM uh, product. Uh, all of those are are getting uh, you know disproportionate uh, you know share versus the competition. And and yeah, I mean it, you know it would be better in a non-COVID environment, but we are seeing uh, you know products uh, get adopted. Uh, we are seeing uh, some price improvement uh, where we have differentiated technology that warrants it. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward for COVID to be, you know, be behind us here, but it, it really hasn't stopped hospitals from adopting, uh, you know, maybe not at the scale they otherwise would have, but adopting new technology. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next question, please, Francesca. Okay, the next question is from Joanne Wench at City. Joanne, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, and thank you for taking the question. Um, two pieces. One, there are a couple of um, headwinds and, and reliefs, we'll call it, next year. Is there a way to quantify the ventilator headwind and the Valiant headwind? And then can you remind us when the China tenders annualizes? Yeah, sure, Joanne. Thanks for the question. Um, in terms of the, I think you meant the Navian headwind. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, we, um, we do expect our, our Q4 revenue to um, be impacted by roughly four, $40 million from that headwind. And then if we look going forward into next year, we're going to be focused on introducing our prior product, the Captivia product, and ramping that up throughout the year. So we expect that to help offset the, the, the headwind from, uh, from Navion. So we expect about 25 to $30 million per quarter in fiscal 22. Um, a little bit higher at the beginning of the year as we're rolling out the product and a little bit less uh, toward the end of the year. Um, and then you had a second question, and I need to remember what that was. Um, it was part of quantifying the ventilator headwind and when the China tenders annualize. Yep, thank you. So on ventilators, um, obviously, uh, sequentially, we're seeing ventilator growth uh, come down as we expected. And we expect that to continue into next year. But keep in mind, ventilator is a is you know a small part of Medtronic, and you know so we we recognize we've got certain headwinds, and we're going to be focused on offsetting where we can. And in terms of of the China tender, you know we expect uh, the China tender uh, along the DES national tender along with 
the balloon uh, multi-provincial uh, tenders to impact us about 45 million uh, a quarter. That will start to anniversary in the second quarter of next year and then fully anniversary in the third quarter of next year. Terrific, thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, next question, please, Francesca. Okay, next question is from Josh Jennings at Cowan. Josh, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, good morning, thanks a lot. I wanted to just focus on the structural hard franchise and the pipeline. Mike Coyle's departure, um, and we've been surprised that Medtronic hasn't pursued an edge-to-edge -edge repair solution. I know the half moon investment is in place, but post the COAP data, <coughs> it's a proven therapy for degenerative and functional mitral regurgitation and, and the only game in town right now. Are there any internal plans outside of half moon to pursue, half moon being a different technology, but are there any internal plans to, to pursue edge-to-edge -edge repair internally? <coughs> and then also wanted to ask about the intrepid enrollment pace and if any updates there, you can share any expectations of when enrollment could be completed. And then lastly, uh, LAAO, uh, any new thoughts or strategy to, to pursue that market, which uh, is, is building nicely. Thanks for taking the questions. Yeah, Josh, I guess I'll start with um, the edge to edge repair. You know, that's based on a, a surgical procedure that isn't done as a standalone surgery anymore. And the reason for that is because you kind of leave you sort of trade one disease for another, right? You bring those edges together and you leave, you fix the leak of the valve, but you leave behind basically a, a stenotic valve, which continues to partially leak. And, you know, the idea of replacing that valve or in the case of like a half moon, where you're basically replacing the back leaflet, um, you can eliminate MR completely and also leave open future options to fix that valve, which you're cut off from in a clip technology. So it doesn't really make sense to us to pursue something that, you know, has a couple of players in it already and has some residual limitations. It makes more sense to go for a repair solution that, that creates more options and does a better job of eliminating the MR. Uh, with regard to the Intrepid trial, you know, we did change the endpoint of that trial and it's uh, picked up a lot. It's a Bayesian design, so the enrollment will be dependent on, on some interim looks down the road. Uh, enrollment did pick up. We did, you know, we continue to have some challenges where there are COVID hotspots at the individual center level, but it's continuing along. And then um, your last question on left atrial appendage, I guess kind of like the first one, unless you have a really differentiated technology that brings more to the party, it's not something that we're going to pursue just me too products in. Uh, we have obviously some interest in that space, but it has to be a technology that really matters and brings a difference to, uh, to the patients and the clinicians. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Uh, let's go to the next question, please, Francesca. All right, the next question is from Matt Taylor at UBS. Matt, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking the question. So I wanted to go back to this uh, commentary that you made about investment in productive capital and, and hospitals uh, gearing up for the snapback in, in procedures. Um, could you offer any thoughts on on whether you think there's pent up demand in the, the system and do you think that that's going to lead to elevated levels of utilization as we go through calendar 21? Uh, is that what you think the hospitals are, are gearing up for or any more color on those uh, uh, investment sure. plans would be helpful? Well, Matt, I, I'll take that one. I, look, I can go back to what we experienced in 2020, right? Uh, after the um, initial wave of COVID hit, um, back in the in the spring time frame, uh, there was a, a a fairly you know especially in, in the U.S. but all, all over the world a, a quick a fairly quick recovery I think much faster than people anticipated, um, and we feel that you know prior to the, the the this latest wave this latest spike of COVID that really hit us in in late December we had worked through the the majority of that backlog. Right, so call that over you know six seven month time frame, and so we would expect something similar here, right? So a, a new backlog has built up, um, and and we expect to be able to work through that over the over the next six months or so. Okay, so Brendan, as a follow up, I was hoping you gave a nice slide in the presentation on the performance by a number of different geographies, and and there was 
pretty good recovery across most of them. Could, could you offer any thoughts on how you see the trends by sure. either developed versus emerging over the next couple periods here? Is it, is it going to be similar in terms of recovery in your mind? Well, well, you know, first of all, uh, I'll start with China. China is pretty much back to normal, right? You know, and and for us, if you back out the impact of the China tender, we had a really strong uh, quarter in China, and, and don't expect that to to change. So China's back to normal. Then I'll come over to the United States, and we talked about that. It, I think the, you know, the worst is behind us with this second wave, and as Karen indicated earlier, we expect uh, to see the recovery. It was a little delayed, I think, by the some of the weather we had here over the last week but to start to see a, a procedural recovery. And we do think that's going to go, you know, fairly uh, robust recovery, fairly, fairly quick, uh, like we saw the, the first spike. Uh, and then Europe, I think, will be, will, will trail the United States by a couple of months. It's just not going to move. I don't think it's going to move quite as fast in terms of recovery. And then if you look at other parts of, you know, Asia Pacific and, and, and Latin America, they, they are back to growth. And I think they'll kind of continue to steadily improve. So, you know, that's the way I'd sum it up. And we're really watching, you know, the U.S. Uh, recovery and, and the Europe one. Uh, and, and like I said, we think Europe will trail the U.S. by a couple of months. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Matt. Um, Francesca, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Can we go to the next question, please? Yeah, the next question is from Matt Mixick at Credit Suisse. Matt, go ahead, please. Hi, thanks so much for taking our questions. Um, so I had, I had one follow-up on, on some of the questions you've, you've had on uh, 2022. And, and as we think about sort of the major drivers, uh, very strong pipeline, obviously, as you've talked about. But if you could call out maybe, you know, some of the, some of the key uh, business lines or where you're going to have continued momentum in, into 2022 and, and maybe some of the some of the larger launches or, or product lines where we should expect those to be kind of the big poles of the tent uh, to get to that, you know, whatever it is that you land on mid single digit growth for 22. And I've got one follow up. Well, look, I, I expect, uh, I know the comps get a little harder with, with micro, but, you know, a strong continued, you know, a, a cardiac rhythm growth into the year. Um, you know, we, in, in, in neuroscience and in, in RTG, um, all the neur the neuromodulation uh, related therapies there with uh, DBS. I think we're going to see a multi year, uh, you know, share gain and, and growth in DBS because we're following up our Percept uh, DBS launch with uh, our new Sensite leads, which enhance the sensing and provide uh, steerability. And we're launching a, a new clinical trial for closed loop adaptive DBS and, and pain. Uh, you know, we've got the, the new DTM uh, product from the Stemgenics acquisition that sits on top of our Intellis platform, and, and that's got a lot of momentum. Uh, and I think the uh, physician community is excited about the idea of us uh, bringing ECAPS to market. So that's, uh, you know, so we've got a lot of momentum there. And, of course, in, in our overactive, our pelvic health business, you know, uh, neuromodulation for overactive bladder, you, you heard in the commentary, we've got a lot of momentum there as well. You know, and then, of course, you've got the, you know, the soft tissue robot launching, um, you know, Bob already articulated the, the, you know, the impact there uh, at the uh, MITG level of a uh, hundred basis points or so. Um, you know, so, so those are, those are some big ones. And I, you know, in cardiology, we've got a lot going on as well. Uh, our, our, a, um, you know, atrial fibrillation business uh, with, with diamond, the diamond temp launch uh, is another one in our first line indication uh, for our cryo product line uh, are also, you know, exciting, I, I think, growth drivers for us. I don't know, Sean, did I, you know, leave anything out there? You've got quite a bit going on in cardiology. No, you got a lot of them, Jeff, and we also have the official market, you know, stenting, so little ones that are there. The replacement heads, headwinds within TACI that I mentioned go away in the coming year, which is good. And, of course, PFA is a disruptive ablation technology for for what we've got coming. The uh, link device, Link 2, as it expands its availability and moves into heart failure, is a growth driver. Tavern will continue to be a great growth driver for us. And then, of course, uh, we've got the Mitral and Nardian franchises in the longer term horizon. I think the message, Matt, I think the message here is, you know, whether it's FY22 or beyond, you know, we are really focused on, you know, not just launching the products in the pipeline, but keeping the pipeline full and, and really managing this business, uh, you know, balancing the short and the long term here. And, and I know that uh, the, 
morale within Medtronic is high, despite all the things going on in the world, despite some of the changes we made. And it's because of the, in, the investment we're making in, in, in our pipeline. And so that, that is something we're going to keep going across the company that we're hyper-focused on that. Great. And the, and the follow-up I had, um, just one of the stories around the pandemic, obviously we've all talked about over the last year has been uh, digital and, and sort of the leveraging of digital technology sales and support and, uh, and patient interaction, et cetera. So wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, both the way that, you know, if, if there's any additional initiatives that worth noting, like what you've done with Viz AI and Stroke, uh, but, but also, you know, how we should think about the productivity of the, of the P&L of operations in, in, a, in a world where, you know, you'll be leaning more, I suppose, on digital in 22 and 23 than you, than you were in 19 and, and, and early 20. Yeah, I mean, there are two two categories, right? The how digital is impacting our, our, our I'll call it our offerings to you know to uh, you know, our, our customers and, and patients. And you mentioned you know Viz AI, which is helping expand the uh, the stroke market and and the way we've in our partnership with them has helped differentiate Medtronic and and drive share. That's a, that's a good example. Um, but I think you know another one that's uh, a big one that uh, we've talked about is is remote capabilities in our cardi in our implantable business, and, and I'll highlight our cardiac rhythm business. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean. I you know even um, there's remote programming, there's remote device management, there's remote patient management, and it is really picking up. Some of this technology was there before COVID, but the uptake was slow, and then during COVID, the timing worked out. We uh, had our, with our pipeline, we launched some additional remote capabilities, but we're seeing things like, for example, MRI, you know, when patients have to go back to, to uh, get in it, go into the hospital and they have an implanted cardiac device, they need an MRI. That used to be more of a manual intervention, a Medtronic field representative, uh, you know, actually going to the hospital uh, to meet with the patient and, and make some programming changes. That now um, is up to 25% uh, or more of those are done now remotely. And it was pretty, it was low single digits prior to COVID. So the, the uptake on that, that's just one example of how, um, you know, digital is changing workflows uh, and providing, you know, I think more, you know, in this case, better patient outcomes, but in more, you know, a lot of efficiencies. So we're seeing, uh, you know, the digital piece take off uh, and, and it will provide also uh, productivity for, for our company. Uh, we believe we can provide, uh, we've learned how to do like medical medical education uh, remotely. Now you can't do all med ed remotely. I mean, there's exchange of scientific data and there's you, there's some ability to train remotely. I mean, obviously uh, at some point, you you know, these physicians are, want to get in a cadaver lab or, uh, you know, and things like that. And, and, and uh, we haven't figured out how to do that remotely. But I th we're amazed that, you know, uh, when our backs were against the wall and you couldn't meet with physicians, uh, how digital uh, came to the rescue and provided a high quality experience. And now physicians, you know, they are now on board with this. So I think that will, you know, one, speed up adoption of new technology, which is a good thing, but two, provide efficiencies, uh, you know, for us. Um, Great, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Uh, let's take the final question, please, Francesca. Okay, our final question comes from Danielle and Halfi at SBD Learning. Danielle, go ahead, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for squeezing me in. I really appreciate it. Um, I just have one question, and that's around um, the capital deployment and how you're thinking about m and I appreciate um, you've talked about more tuck-in type of deals. You've been pretty successful there, very active. But I guess just digging a little bit deeper, sort of where, where are the areas that you see white spaces from a technology perspective and or where you feel like you need the scale from a technology or geographic distribution perspective that we should be thinking about Medtronic potentially being most active over the next, call it one to two years. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for the question, Danielle. You know, look, the M&A, the, these, um, you know, I'd call them, you know, um, I won't call them bite size, but smaller uh, tuck-in deals where we're getting uh, at the at these companies at, at relatively early stage, uh, just, you know, in most cases before commercialization, um, it seems to be something that's working for us. So we can do more of these. We add more value 
uh, and we're getting them at values that make sense and we're getting good returns on these and we're spreading our, our, our risk uh, across a number of these deals. And I would expect that uh, you know, to, to continue. And I think the most of the work of these tuck-ins, most of the volume rather, will come around uh, you know, our existing, uh, existing therapies and existing markets to augment them uh, and, and really, we, I look at it as an extension of our organic growth strategy because we're not buying growth here. We're buying uh, technology and, uh, and, and, then, and, and, and then, you know, kind of adding to that, whether it be additional technology or clinical science and, and, then, and then making these uh, standard of care around the world. Uh, so that's going to be the lion's share of it. In terms of white space, uh, you know, this is something, you know, we haven't signaled where, you know, we're always looking at, you know, new markets to better position the company uh, you know, uh, uh, to optimize our portfolio for growth. You know, when you start looking at white space, truly outside of the, you know, then you kind of move outside of the tuck-in, uh, and these tend to be a little larger. Um, and and this really is something we're always looking at uh, if we think it's the right uh, move to, you know, help our portfolio. Uh, but but the focus is the tuck-ins. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, Jeff, uh, please go ahead with your closing remarks. Okay. All right. Well, look. Thanks everybody for the for the the great questions, and and really appreciate your support and 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 the continued interest in in Medtronic. We hope that you'll join us again on our Q4 earnings webcast, which we anticipate holding on May 27th, where we'll update you on our quarterly progress and look ahead uh, to fiscal 22. I know there's a lot of questions on uh, 22 today, so we'll get at that uh, in our Q4 call. So thanks for tuning in today, uh, and please stay healthy and safe. The vaccine's on the way, and have a great day. Thank you.